Ewing by Peggy Wood. In the days before endowments bred coveted naming rights to the wings and the billions and the architectural landscapes, it was just the People's Museum, a tall stone stairway leading to a house of gingerbread and rooms that led one to the other, seemingly inescapable. A place to go on a Sunday afternoon to add some culture to otherwise drab lives. To gaze at colors so bold, you dream about them for weeks. Imagine places where those views were born. Though in his 80s, Robert has the time of a free man to visit the museum any day he wants. He has come in on Saturday so he can become immersed in the multitude, listen to others delight in the artistic mind as he and Helen once did, perhaps try out his own voice in the rooms of play. Passing the elevator his wife would have insisted he take, he turns to the stairs leading to the entrance, counts the steps, hesitates, and grabs the handrail and prepares to hoist himself up, step by step. Instead, two men coming down the upstairs face force him to go up the downstairs disorder, which he dislikes. At the top of the wrong staircase, he wobbles, leans on his walking stick, a mangled redwood pole from his hiking days, at odds with his pressed suit and shiny wingtip shoes. Even with a stick for support, the steep stairs have winded him as he recovers from a lingering illness. First a malaise of unknown origin, leading to an ailment of an indeterminate nature before finally being diagnosed as the equally ambiguous frailty syndrome. <laughs> One unease leading to another, like the ruins in this museum, until the ultimate discontent, waking to find his Hélène stiff in the morning. He pauses in front of a door taller than he is twice over. A teenage boy reaches around. Here you go, sir, the boy says. Robert nods, passes through the doorway. Inside, he waves a subscription card and walking stick at the young girl behind the counter, expecting entrance. Though a younger man might be relieved of the stick on the shoulder high or delayed by justifications. He removes his wool beret, toddles a few steps juggling stick and beret before folding the hat in half, stuffs it in his pocket, finds it balance. A uniformed man with a stubby gun strapped to his hip leans into the wall, taking up too much space. He gives Robert Stick a long look, but he doesn't say anything. Robert takes, his me uh, Robert takes measure of the guard, more boy than man, with face pimply and adolescently round. He finds his countenance unpleasant, his presence out of time. He supposes, he supposes this peculiarity must have surfaced during his years away. A welcome reminder of the German soldiers who strolled the new halls of the Musée d'Orsay in Paris during the war. Not the war to end all wars, that was his father's, but the one that came after. The one where he became a man, did things that could not be undone, saw what could never be unseen. Soldiers quick to pull a pistol when their commands were not understood by them, those unaccustomed to language bold and throaty like the junkyard dogs bark. Robert's destination is the Herald Gallery, where the Kingsley exhibit closes that day. He's certain of this, having tucked a postcard announcing the annual show into his inside jacket pocket, where it is tattered from the many times he's checked it to make sure he hadn't gotten the date wrong. Robert never bought, even as a young man, looks for the doses. Those older women with pearls and silk dresses and hair that was set once a week by a woman named Doris. <laughs> Elegant women like his Helene. <clears throat> and the men in their great Gatsby dapperness, always suited and suspended with the pocket kerchief, as a man should be, always so calm, so cheerful. Without Helene to guide him, Robert walks with the slow and careful gait of someone more accustomed to sitting. He moves between two ornate mahogany staircases leading to the second and third floors. He looks up at the great space filled with outsized portraits of dour men and women passes through the grand ballroom to the narrow library gallery, where a small television is lodged in the corner. Black and white images slide off the screen every few seconds. The display puzzles him. He cannot remember when he's seen a television in an art gallery that was mutilated, painted, or somehow part of the art form, another disorder to digest. A man of middling age in clothes made for running follows the images on the television. His head slowly bobbles left to right and back again. 
A woman in matching leisure wear peers over his shoulder. Her head bobs in time with this. A small book is anchored next to the television with a plaque stating, Watching the Sacramento Kings, photographs by Vesna Pavlovich, is available in the museum store for $3.95. If you are pictured in the catalog, you are entitled to one free copy. <laughs> you must be recognizable in the photograph. <laughs> Images on the television are not eligible. Check the book to see if you can be found watching the Kings. <laughs> the man turns to the book and shakes his head with each page turn, the dull sheen of a titanium watch on his wrist. I'm running out of time, the woman whispers, low but with an emphasis on time. The man flicks one eye at her as he continues to scan the slideshow. Where are we? The husband asks. He said we were in the crowd. We're out of time, she persists. He taps his arm, but he shakes off her touch, doesn't move. Robert is vaguely aware of the kings, supposes it is assumed he has a fuller body of knowledge than he possesses about such things. Perplexed, he asks the couple, who are these kings? <laughs> the woman looks at him, starts to answer, when the man cuts her up. What? Robert asks again, the kings, what are they? The kings, you know, the basketball team. The basketball team, the man says, dragging out the words slowly as if Robert is simple and returns to the screen. Robert rests on his stick and watches the couple fitted in clothes more suited to play than the appreciation of art. He, who is properly dressed and ready to embrace art, feels out of place. A stranger in these rooms of plenty. Can we fast forward? asks the woman. The man doesn't reply, and they continue watching the photographs slide from screen to screen as if they are viewing the birth of the firstborn grandchild. <laughs> Minutes pass before the woman points to the corner of a shot crowded with dozens of people sitting, eating, drinking, talking. There you are, she says. Really? The man asks. Very granular, she says. That's all fellow, he tells her. So he took it from the crowd. I don't know, he cuts her off. While others pass through the small space on their way to other exhibits, they move on quickly. Clearly, the couple have camped, claiming the television is their own. I can't imagine what Jean saw, the woman says. What did she say? She said she saw my picture on TV. We have to go. The meter's going to run out. But she said she saw me, the man says, like a boy who sees his father eat the cookies and milk left for Santa. <laughs> she pats his arm as he finally surrenders his place. Watching these kings? This is art? Robert asks the retreating couple. The woman glances at him. The man waves him off. Robert shakes his head, agreeing not for the first time that Herbert Gann's dissection of popular culture would hit the mark. American sensibilities really are in decline. Negotiating the tremors that are an inconvenient reminder of the circumstance, Robert stops and asks the guard who has followed him. Where are the docents? The man looks at him. That docents, Robert repeats. The guard shakes his head, looks puzzled. Robert tries again. The, the people who tell you about the paintings. Oh, you mean the art house? <laughs> There's one in here in the, the Herald Gallery. The guard points to the white doorway into the next space. Robert nods. The Herald Gallery is perfect. Walking stick clicking like sluggish boot heels on the parquet floor. He moves into the gallery and is relieved the Kingsley exhibit is still hanging. A man of loose authority, whose unpressed short sleeve shirt and canvas trousers are not of the docents of Robert's memory, is lecturing to the small group of visitors. The host seems to be at least marginally interested in art, though not terribly informed, occasionally reading what is printed on a plaque before offering questions straight out of an art appreciation course at the city college. What is the artist doing? Why am I looking at it? Each question drowns in a pause, unanswered. He was no Hélène. Hélène, whose dissections of the play of light and shadow, the emotionality of color, made people nod their heads, ask questions of their own. When Robert met Hélène during the war, she was an art history major at the École des Beaux-Arts, paying her keep with the tours of the Dorsey. Hélène, who's telling of a particularly insightful backdrop to a lesser-known painting by Henri Matisse, engaged him as a young soldier, the most uninvolved viewers. 
The way she threaded in art history and aesthetics in a manner that completely charmed him. He tunes out the imposter, longing for the playful authority of a true esthete like Helen. And she said, Matisse would, to the despair of his contemporaries, that he desired to create art that was a soothing, calming influence on the mind, rather like a good armchair. <laughs> Indeed, much of his work was a comforting milieu in an unsettled world. Later, over Café au lait, Hélène would ask him, do you think that's true? That art should be comfortable? Before he could arrange his thoughts without stumbling, she said, I don't think I do. I do not think life is happily ever after. I think it is moments of pure joy bursting through the shadows, strung together like endless waves crashing into the sea. Art should be like that, at times dark and raging, at other times brilliant. But above all, it should make you feel alive. Don't you think that's true? More than half a century later, his answer would still be yes. Robert concludes the proper doses have gone missing. Besides, this is worrisome. Why, who could expect persons untidy, or worse, those whose bulk was ill-contained and pistol-strapped, to decipher the niceties required to restore order when things came undone, as they inevitably will in public spaces. The docents always know what to do, exactly how to calm a situation. Small children, overtired and bored, a photographer boldly ignoring signs prohibiting flash photography, the intemperate, and those who are disagreeable in general. Partly their pleasant nature, partly their indoctrination into the ways of the museum, they were first to remind visitors, unruly or otherwise, that one must embrace art, breathe the lingering linseed oil from canvases, feel the ebb and flow of the painter's stroke. Art was corporeal, living, breathing, blood pulsing, veins opened on stretched canvas. It was what quieted his nature, for he was not at all times the doddering man his agent was portrayed. Trapped in a body stiff with the ache of joints misshapen, his mind was often still a robust soldier in faraway lands, a man with things to forget. Unsettled, Robert arranges himself on the bench, parks his stick, adjusts to the dim lighting, and takes in the exhibit, eager to see the 74th Kingsley jury, uh, Kingsley jury exhibition of California artists. His Helen was a longtime member of a more than 100-year-old Kingsley art club, until lymphoma took her eyesight, and finally her brain, before her body just gave up and eased away. And then, who found such pleasure in discovering early works by Elmer Bischoff and Ralph Goins, and watching her style transform over the years with new complexities, or at times stripped down to something entirely new. Both artists, in their own manner, reminiscent of Edward Hopper's portraits of melancholy. Hopper, whose expressions of aloneness, even while coupled, are so familiar to Robert. How at times he could be in the same room with Hélène when happiness crashed, leaving a wall between. A time when he thought he could outrun his past for the young French girl to love him, be a different man in his character for a while. Robert surveys the gallery, stops at Helmet Head a six-foot oil rendering of a dull, spaceship-like object floating in darkness. Finds its colors bleak without the humanity Hopper's work brings. Hopper, whose moody pieces mirrored Robert's life with Helen, whose turbulent nature had been both exciting and inescapable, are now a comfortable memory, reassuring in a way that they both once disdained. He isn't certain if he likes first prize winner Lori Curran's Restaurant One, a life-size waiter in pre-flight rushing past a high counter while balancing an entire cheesecake one-handed like a matador. Folded into a white ankle-length apron, Robert can almost feel the slight breeze as the waiter flutters past the counter. He approves of the man's black-fitted jacket and strident pen, but combined with his Hitler-like profile, finds it unnerving. The artist's asking price of twenty thousand dollars is unfathomable. Robert eyes a surprisingly realistic ceramic tower of sherbet-colored face plots. Pastel pile. He doesn't see anything striking about a sack of square material used to clean one's face and unclothed body. It's common, it's comfortable even, 
and chuckles at the robust debate he and Ellen would surely patter later over coffee and chocolate croissant. Um, now only an imaginary challenging of the artist's intent. Three grade school girls rush to the sculpture, identical blonde ponytails bouncing. Mom, Mom, this is in a museum, they say. Their excited voices trip over each other. Isn't that pretty, Mom says. Robert cackles, says loudly, it's a pile, all right. <laughs> the woman pulls the girls away from the sculpture. <laughs> Robert calls after her. I can see you like it well enough, but do you know why? Is it the way the pretty, pretty colors are stacked? Now that takes talent. <laughs> Don't listen to that rude old man, the woman tells the girls. She gives him a last look of disapproval. Robert watches the family rush away. Doesn't care for the way satisfaction gives way to a slow boil in his belly. He wonders if the audience is too much, too soon. It's been years since he's seen the Kingsley exhibit. He thought it would bring him closer to Helen, who he sometimes convinces himself has only gone missing. Instead, he wishes he was sitting in his chair with a small glass of brandy. Shaking off his unease, Robert sees an antique settee in the corner of the gallery. gallery. He gathers his stick and, with the patience of a man who is accustomed to taking his time, shuffles to the half circle covered in rose damask. Finds its high back is more welcoming than its design would dictate. He misses the couple's chattering from earlier, baffling as it was. He startles when the woman says to him, What a beautiful couch. Yes, he begins, <coughs> clearing his throat. Yes, it is. Turning to her, Can you imagine if they put them together? She asks. Robert tracks her long fingers pointing to the matching settee in another corner. Oh, we must make a sub, he says, suddenly delighted. He enjoys the perfection of the closed loop. A sharp conversation carries from the other side of the Herald Gallery, just as a father carries a sobbing toddler from the king's room. A guard is two steps behind him. There is no touching allowed, the guard says. Dad shrugs as the guard returns to the gallery. D.V., 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 the boy shouts until his mom stops him with a swollen pacifier. Sur uh, surveying the gallery of untouchables, the family leaves. Robert tells the woman sharing the city, What were they thinking, bringing a small child to a museum, disrupting the enjoyment of art? Why, it's unruly, just not done. <laughs> yes, she says, children should be seen and not heard. <laughs> Sometimes not even seen. <laughs> Robert agrees, watches the guard settling into the wall like one of those live mannequin exhibits. Two men pass a nearby painting of Mickey Mouse in an overgrown and garishly hued garden called The Land of Plenty. Cool, they both say. Robert mutters and pounds his stick. Gesturing to Mickey, he turns to whisper to Ellen. Rubbish, he says. But it's only the same pleasant woman beside him. Isn't it, though, she says. They settle into companionable silence. He studies the four-by-four four dripped acrylic painting just feet away. Do you remember us? Its brilliant pink layers, thick like taffy with blotches of red and bright blue, is a study in photos, bright colors that seem to pulse with their own tempo to pull him into the scene. Robert examines the canvas more carefully until suddenly the mass of colors take shape. He recognizes the scene as one from more than 60 years ago. It's a dirt road plowed from, plowed from of an end of seasoned cornfield, a naturally pink with blood, rivulets of madness, a dozen or more people dumped in the road, a tangled mass, limbs at unnatural angles. Men and women and the smaller bodies of children. Their clothes are drowned in blood, thick under the hot sun. Even smaller bodies are scattered a few feet from the others, toys, a dog or a cat. He is back in Tunisia, French North Africa, 1943, before the Allied forces from Britain, America, and France captured German and Italian troops. He swallows the vial that is clogging his throat, a nerve that the artist has captured, put on display what he has never told anyone, not even Alain. Helen, who he was certain would never forgive him if she had known that, as a young man of 19, deep in a cornfield where they had hidden him from German soldiers, he had heard these people, under French protection, deny seeing an Allied soldier. Heard them beg the armed men to leave, 
then scream, shattering the day like slaughtered animals until finally there was only silence. Robert feels the woman move forward on the bench next to him, sees her stare intently at the painting. Alarmed, he's afraid of what she sees, what Helen would see in the killing field. He clears his throat, starts to say something, anything, to stop her from his view and she says, I wonder how many layers of paint there are. If he used a stick. She doesn't see anything at all, unlike Helen, who had ferreted out the truth, untangling one lie after the other until there was nothing left but regret. Imagining this woman as, as his confessor strikes him is ridiculous, an intolerable insult. She, who is so unlike his Helen, who would never make such a trivial observation. He growls, you don't know Helen? Who? She asks. Silence sits between them as he tries to sort the past. She tries again. Who is Helen? Finally, he says, never mind. She gathers his purse, lightly touches his shoulder, but withdraws when his back stiffens. Her exit is lost in a cacophony of voices as the gallery fills. The tourist follows Robert, who anticipates the sameness of their chatter, as absurd as if they are discussing what they saw in a magazine. Isn't it pretty? Look, it's Mickey Mouse! I like the girl in the red dress, except she looks hungry. <laughs> I'll tell you, here's this Ellen again. A soothing, calming influence, rather like a comfortable armchair. Mm -hmm. He twists his neck to find her, but like a ghost, she is no longer there. The art host glares at the elderly man whose movements have interrupted his talk. Robert, his tired body shrinking like an ancient artifact, listens again for Ellen's voice. Instead, the clatter of the art host crowds these memories. The realism of pastel pile is a testament to the artist's skill. Robert stands, pounds the floor again with a stick. It's crap! He shouts, <laughs> pushing the art post, who starts to push back and stops. Robert struggles to make his voice stronger, louder, gaining speed like an unmanned train. Stop! Stop your nattering! Open your eyes! There! That is little Ivan who is afraid of the snakes, and Ephra, his mother, who soaks the grains for the evening meal. Ige, named because she was born feet first and always running. People look at him, at the field of cotton candy, at each other, whispering as they back away from the mother. Look at them. Don't be afraid. They need you to see. He moves toward the group, a dance of advance in the tree. Robert is getting more agitated. I should have seen them. Why didn't I save them? He asks. The guard approaches Robert as he reaches inside his jacket. Sir, just calm down. Robert ignores him. The guard unsnaps his holster with a small pop, repeats the order. Sir, put your hands where I can see them. He moves closer. Robert loses his balance, swings his walking stick too wide, topples the tower of ceramic cloth, which crashes to the museum floor, spattering pastel pieces like shrapnel. You and your fucking bastardized friends and your silly kings and gardens of plenty. You think that is art? Truth is for the damned! He sputters. Robert fumbles inside his jacket, his hand caught in the suspender. Someone says, He's got a gun! The guard unholsters his weapon, barks at Robert. Hands in the air! Now! While others rush to the doorway, a young mother trips over her stroller and sprawls to the floor. Her orange and red blossom dress puffs around her like dust on that pink road surrounded by cornfields. Her child, still strapped in a wheelchair, begins to wail. A woman tries to help her right herself, but the, woman, but the mother's dress is caught in a wheel. Finally, she rips it free, and the three of them make it through the door to the other galleries, the baby's mournful cry trailing behind them, softer and softer until the distance drowns its cries. It is finally silent in the Herald Gallery. Only the guard and Robert, who steadies himself and sputters to the room. Look at them! Just look at them! This is true! He waves his wild cane, pitches forward inches from the canvas waiter suspended from the ceiling. The guard draws his gun level with Robert's heart, his face an explosion of capillaries. He moves closer to Robert, who loses his balance, tumbling hard to the bench in front of the killing fields opens his jacket to reveal a white handkerchief he has untangled from the suspender. He briefly waves the white cloth at the guard and wipes the tears staining his cheeks. 
The guard shakes his head and turns redder still. He pulls himself together, bolsters his gun, and straightens his back. Robert closes his eyes, longs for the voice he both loves and fears. Oh, Robert. He hears a lens bereaved tone, the way she carved two, syllable, two syllables out of one, let his name fade off her tongue and he had disappointed her. He could almost hear her say, what a display, that's not how we behave. <laughs> he needs to tell her about the women, and the babies, the men too, all slaughtered while he crouched like a terrified scarecrow buried in those fields. How the light-hearted man she met in a museum so many years ago had been lost on a bloody road in Africa. <laughs> Slow minutes pass, each second a long sorrow. Robert turns to tell her, Forgive me, Helen. Forgive me, please. But there is no one left to hear him as he sinks into the silence on a long, low bench facing an end-of-season cornfield, but naturally 